versions, sustainable logging, and more. Nowadays, he quit fishing logs out of the water and started putting them back in. Chris started the Beaver Corps training program in 2018 and immediately put his engineering brain on the challenge of beaver dams washing out in Iowa. Um, so please welcome him. He just got in off the road from Iowa. So um, give a warm welcome to Christian Sorflatten. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, and uh, great to be here. Yeah, I just got in here. Uh, no time to get nervous, right? Anyway, um, yeah, so Iowa, nobody wants beavers in Iowa. Iowa kills, in every county in Iowa, they kill over 100 beavers every year. And there's nowhere to relocate them to either because all of the creeks have been like drained out and dredged out and like some of them are like 20 feet deep of stream incision at, at this one site we're working on. And then they build a dam, it just gets washed out immediately. And so the people that do want the beavers don't have anywhere to put them because they just get washed out. And uh, after watching Carrie's talk, uh, Iowa, I would estimate, has a 99% unhealthy creeks situation. <laughs> and uh, it, it's mostly like a mud shoots, like just mud, a lot of clay and mud. Even in towns and campuses, and then the places that don't have farms, they don't want the beavers eating the trees. And that, of course, is due to the drain tile. So something like 90-something percent of the state of Iowa is covered with corn and soy farms, and underneath all that farmland is drain tile. So it's like plastic corrugated tubing with perforations in it, and so like every time it rains in Iowa, it just floods. That soil cannot hold any water at all, and that's why there's, and it's crazy, you'll be hanging out and it rains and the water will get 10 feet deep in an hour and then back down to zero, one inch deep like by the end of the day. And it's just, it's crazy. Which leads us to our project called the Watertight Beaver Dam Analog. So that way, we're, so we've been experimenting for four years now on how to build a a BDA, or a, a, actually a watertight BDA, so that it will actually attract beavers to the creeks. Because beavers like two or three feet deep of water minimum to build a lodge. And so that's the whole idea. And um, after four years of failure, we finally had some success. And we came up with two designs. I, I don't know, did, did anyone read the paper? I, I posted, did that get posted on the, <laughs> yeah, the abstract, and, the, and then I wrote a paper too, I guess, okay, yeah, uh, we still have about nine minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and just um, skip ahead of my fun stuff, so I have like a, a 15 minute video we made giving a tour and right now we're just waiting for it to upload. But since it is called Beavers and Climate Change, I have some fun notes on that. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so I was hanging out one day and I was like, hey, NASA says that all of the ocean rise is due to ice melt. NASA literally says that. And everyone says that, right? Is that everyone's understanding? Yeah, yeah ice melt. <laughs> okay, so I was hanging out one day and I looked at the NASA data and it was only like 20 something like cub cubic kilometers of since in the last 20 years have melted in the, in the um, all over the world, right? 20 something, 20,000 cubic kilometers, right? I was like, you know what, I have a math degree, I'm gonna double check this. 
I was like, punched it into my, cal my phone calculator, and I was like, all right, how much with 20 something thousand cubic kilometers raise the ocean? It was like, it was like an inch and a half, right? In the last 20 years, the ocean has risen, I think like eight inches. And then you keep reading the NASA website and it says, oh, well, the rest of it's due to thermal expansion. Anybody know what that means? Okay, so like when you heat up water, it gets bigger, it ex expands. And I'm like, listen, I'm a, I have a science degree, a science background, I'm like, I don't buy it, you know? And there's no data on it either. Like, they don't even know how hot the ocean is getting. So the deeper you, there's like, there's something like 10,000 sensors measuring the surface temperature of the ocean, but there's only like a couple hundred measuring the deep ocean temperatures. And um, it's really fishy, really suspect. So, I did a quick Google, is everybody following me right now? Any questions? <laughs> Are we getting excited yet? All right, so I did a quick Google search. I was like, how much aquifers depletion is there from agriculture, you know? And I was like, okay, I found this one website. I was like, wow, it's like, Dude, over the last 20 years, right, from the, from the time that NASA really started studying it, um, there's something like so many thousands of cubic kilometers of water they're pulling out of the aquifer to farm all the farms around the world. And this is something that people do monitor. Like, the, there is data on it, and it, it's easy to find, and it's like, wow, they're like, most countries in the world are draining their aquifers to farm. And we do it here, that Ogallala aquifer's about empty, you know, and um, that's one of the biggest aquifers in the world. So, so just with the agricultural irrigation, that accounts for one third of the ocean level rise, about two inches in the last 20 years. Because guess what? When you pull water out of the aquifer, it doesn't go back to the aquifer. Unless, of course, you have beavers, right? When you pull water out of the aquifer, and it, it water your crops, and then it evaporates, right? And it goes into the water cycle with the rain. It doesn't go back to the aquifer. The aquifer, that's why the aquifers drain more every year. In Fairfield, Iowa, where I'm from, the aquifer drops 20 feet a year. And so we're, we're, we're like 20 years away from the critical phase or whatever. Anyway, okay, uh, so any questions on that? Yeah. Okay, so, so you're talking about NASA and NASA data and looking at the levels of groundwater decline. Did you come across the new NASA map that somehow or another looks at the gravitational pull of landscape? So there's actually a NASA satellite that looks yeah. at the rates of groundwater decline and subsidence around the world, and what he's saying is, yeah. is quite accurate. There are many places that yeah. you can see the groundwater decline and the subsidence, the related subsidence, and you can measure this from space. So in many places we're, well, in most places, we are mining our groundwater incredibly faster than we're replenishing it, and groundwater is a lot like a bank account. It is yeah. very wise to deposit more groundwater than it's, it's very wise to be depositing more than you would draw, because if you do that, you'll be overflowing with wealth and overflowing with water. But if you always treat your groundwater like a bank account and you're always withdrawing more than you deposit, pretty soon you're thirsty and broke. Yeah, they, they call it fossil water. Fossil water, yeah, and, uh, and, and you think it'd be easy to measure the ocean rising, like how much is it really rising? Guess what? The ocean's actually sinking in some, because the land is rising. In some places, so it looks like the ocean's dropping. Because guess what happens when you have the ice melting on your plate, on your plate tectonic plate? Your ice melts here, and the water rises here, you, then the plate shifts, it goes boink, like, you know, it's just, it does all kinds of crazy stuff. So that's why they literally need to have 10,000 sensors around the world to measure the sea level rise. 
Anyway, so that's, that's a, then my next paper I want to write. And I have a few more fun papers, too, I want to write. <clears throat> huh? <What? laughs> Two more minutes till movie time. Okay. Um, okay, here's a fun one. California. Anybody been to California in the last 10, 20 years? It's like, I think I was, I was gone from Northern California. I was gone for 15 years, came back. I was like, oh my God. Last summer, I was like, this whole place is turning into Death Valley. And I was like, let's go tour some wetlands and see some beavers, you know? We drove all over the Sacramento River Valley. Everything was dry. All of the bulrush was dry, covered in spider webs. It was like over 100 degrees everywhere, brutal, no wind. And the only sign I found of beavers were some beaver chew sticks in a culvert. I was like, oh, hey, there's some sticks. Like, no, just, and um, so, so how do we bring rain back to California, right? Does that sound doable? Okay. All we have to do, so I was driving around, I was like, okay, I'm from Iowa, we got 20 foot ditch, drainage ditches in Iowa. California has like 50 to 80 foot deep drainage ditches all over Northern California. Like the Russian River is like 80 feet down. And like my friend's backyard is like 60 feet down, it's crazy. And when it floods there, all those ditches fill up, you know, it's crazy. So. So what do we do? So, so here's the next paper I want to write. I actually want to study. You can actually calculate. If you were to fill in all those rivers and turn it back into wetland, that used to be a giant lake called Lake Tulare, the biggest lake west of the Great Lakes. But they drained it for farms. And, you know, wetland sediment is a great uh, soil builder, right? So... So you could actually calculate how much it'd be worth to bring rain back to California. It's tourism, ecology, and, and the way you do it is you undredge the rivers, right? Does that sound impossible? No, that's right, it's not. In fact, all those rivers have been undredged before. And who knows when that was? In the California gold rush, when they would blast away whole mountains and it would fill in all those rivers, right? So we could actually pay for this project with the gold we collect by blasting down a selected mountain. <laughs> you don't even need the gold to pay. I mean, the, the thing is, it's causing a drought on the entire western half of the country and that drought is moving east. I mean, I, I really can't imagine it ever of coming to Iowa because we got the Missouri River there to kind of block it. But, um, <clears throat> I mean, the economic devastation from all that heat and that drought far outweighs the economic benefit of agriculture in California. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm about ready. I'm telling all my friends, hey, let's ban California produce. Forget it. Almonds. Forget it. Stop buying it. Like, it's creating a horrific devastation. Yeah, unflood those rivers, and then the beavers can start damming them again. Who knows what the biggest industry is in the country by gross revenue every year? No, fishing. Fishing is part of what industry? Outdoor recreation. Yeah. Recreation is over a trillion, it's the first trillion dollar a year industry in America. It just beat oil and petroleum by 900 billion. You know, barely. So that's like all your ATVs, all your boats, all your RVs, you know, all these big ticket items people are saving up for, 
I got into this whole like uh, beaver thing because I like to go canoeing in Iowa. It's the best, it's the most fun thing. It's like you're floating down the creek, there's your foxes, your beavers, and your otters playing with the paddle, you know, you got your friends out there, kids, and it's just, it's a wildlife corridor. All the wildlife lives on the creek. And when the, when the, when the water is just right, it just rained a few days ago, then it's just bliss, you know, for hours. Anyway, and, and, uh, and it's like every time I take people there and they're just like, wow, this is the best thing ever, you know? Why didn't we know about this before? I was like, yeah, but why didn't anyone tell? I had to actually find it on my, on my own and, like, discover it. And, like, you know, all my teachers were like, oh, no, it's too difficult, blah, blah. And, like, you never know what the water's going to do. It's like, well, you got to learn what the water does, you know. And then, um, so then I kind of studied the whole subject. And uh, anyway, it's like, well, why don't we turn Iowa into a tourist state, you know? Why don't we turn all states into tourist states. Like, I, like once, I, once I discovered canoeing right in my, in my county, like, I don't even want to go anywhere else. It's just so fun to keep going there and watch it like transform, you know? And then the, all these cool things happen. Like the DOT started using native grass seeds on the highways. So then like all those seeds are washing down. It's, it's like restoring the creeks. And it's like, wow, like, you know, and then it rains, of course, and everything gets messed up, you know, and, like turns into mud again, but that happens less and less every year. So how do we turn Iowa and all states into tourist states? Okay. Well, okay, Iowa. One third of all the corn goes to ethanol, corn-based ethanol. Uh, is anybody in favor of corn-based ethanol here? Yeah, what? No. <laughs> okay, like, once you start learning about corn-based ethanol, it's like, few things will make you that irritated. It's actually mandated by law, the Clean Air Act, signed by Jimmy Carter in 78-something. And they're like, okay, well, ten, certain percentage of, like, fossil, of uh, all fuel should be renewable. So they're like, and it's like, of course, Wall Street jumps on board. They're like, okay, well, what are we going to do? Like, well, let's do, we got all this corn, you know? It's not worth anything. Let's, let's create this industry of the corn-braised ethanol, and that'll, that'll drive the price of corn up, and it'll be heavily subsidized. And so now it's like, you know, uh, here we are, like, trying to go canoeing, you know? But instead, all our creeks are either flooded or too low because of corn-based ethanol. It's like, and then the, uh, for every gallon you get, it actually takes a gallon of petroleum fuel to like for the tractors to grow. So it's like this, this most uh, irritating thing on the planet. Okay, well check this out. What's a good alternative to corn-based ethanol? What about wood gas and wood diesel? you know, as a, bio, as a byproduct from the biochar industry, from creating biochar out of wood, as a waste, as a byproduct, you also get wood gas or wood diesel. By far more efficient way to produce renewable energy. So that's another paper I want to write is Let's get a grant going. Start turning the corn ethanol plants into wood, wood gas, biochar plants. And of course, the biochar is amazing. Why don't we have more biochar? It's the best fertilizer. You know, it's, it's the best fertilizer in the world. Why does Iowa have the best soil in the world? Because of all the char from Native Americans burning prairie. All that char built up that soil. Same thing in the Amazon where they have that terra gold, black gold there, and uh, whatever, the terra prima, or whatever they called it. Um, also, my, uh, the, the professor at the university in Fairfields, he's really into the idea. He, he wants to build um, 3D printed houses out of clay and biochar mixed together. 
because biochar absorbs odors, it absorbs moisture, you know, it's insulative, it's like super cheap, and um, so yeah, biochar is fun. You can burn it, you know, you can cook it, cook with it. And then the other cool thing I really want to do is start converting the cornfield. Okay, so why, why are we growing corn, transporting it thousands of miles to the animals to eat, and then we transport the animals thousands more miles to get butchered, and then we transport the packaged meat thousands more miles back to here or wherever, you know? And it's just like, why don't we just grow prairie with grazing animals, you know? It's like, why? <laughs> well, uh, you know, big business put all the small town butcheries out of business. They dropped the price, they lost money for a year, put everyone out of business, and then they jacked the prices back. It's like, okay, so simple. All we need is more butcheries, more meat lockers, get the ball rolling. So that's another. So I think that might be like a piece of legislation I want to write. You know, I talk a lot about writing grants. Well, writing legislation is a lot easier. Just write it and say, I know a guy, you know, send it to Seneca. <laughs> okay. Any questions or comments? Can can you give us a 30 second elevator speech on, on your, um, on your BDA that uh, doesn't pass water? Because usually they're sort of super porous. Yeah, so, um, so last year we, we finally started to just try and do it. And, and what we noticed was, it was like, tr it was like, hey, it's cool, clay. It's $4 a ton, you know, it's awesome. And then we're sitting there shoveling, it's like, by God, it's like two people, two hours to shovel clay, at like two tons of clay out of my truck. You know, and I was like, oh, forget it, right? And I was like, costing the client like $5,000 kind of thing per dam. And then I was like, all right, well, forget this. So I um, bought a dump, tr dump kit for my truck for 1700 bucks, and now it's like, it's awesome. We can do five loads in five hours of clay. And guess what? Clay, like, if you tamp it down and like jump on it and kind of break it up and then mix the big pieces with the small pieces kind of thing, so you're not like putting a whole bunch of big pieces on top of each other, and you actually get like actual watertight plug and you just, watch your one inch little like nothing creek with your like tiny little half inch bonsai frogs, all of a sudden they're just like, everything explodes. You know, all of a sudden, like leeches will just start swimming out, you know, and like dragonflies will come and eat the mosquitoes and it's like the coolest thing, the fish get bigger. And then, um, so of course you can't just use clay, you have to, figure out a way to anchor the clay. So, so, uh, so that's why we, we built the first one on a BDA with actual stakes. And it had a log. Because if you build a BDA in Iowa, guess what? It gets washed out. First, first rain, it's gone. Like it's straight gone. I don't care how deep you drive your posts into the clay. So if you do a BDA in Iowa, you have to have a log on the top to help hold this, the posts in place. So uh, we did that, and then we did a weave, and then we piled up the clay against the weave, and, and that worked. It worked great. And then we put rocks on top of that, like gravel, small gravel and big gravel. And then, um, and then we decided, like, you know what? So I actually kind of did 10 years of um, logging and sawmilling. Right, so I was like, okay, well, it's easy for me to get posts, you know, and I have a, I have a 
gas pounder, post pounder too, you know, we got. And it's like, okay, well, it's, it's easy for me to do it, but what I wanted to do is make it simple enough for anyone, any landscaping artist, any kind of landowner, all you need is a truck, you know, hopefully a dump truck, and like a shovel, you know? And then, so, so we started building dams like that, and the first one we built um, worked great. And, 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 then, and, then the, and then our trick was to just pound a bunch of willow in it. So, uh, so we show up with like 100 willow, and, and then that was the idea. Like, so at first we did like one willow per four square feet, right? Like a grid of willow, pound it in. And then, um, and then we were like, wow, this is awesome, it's working. But then, uh, and this is part of the video, and then and you, you go there during the rain, right? When it's raining, and, that, and it's, it's really important to do that. Because you see how erosion happens. You see the force of the water creating a wave and hitting the bottom of the creek. And that's where it, it, the most of the, that force is. You know, you're redirecting the water at the bottom, and, that, and that's where you know, normally you see a scour pool. Right, so what's happening is it starts eating away at the gravel and the rocks at the bottom. So I, that's one of the things I teach my workers, like erosion always starts at the bottom. I don't know. And, and you can see it in the video. Um, and, and then uh, restoration always starts at the top of the watershed. So that's why like, we're talking about bison and prairie and stuff. So that it, the water goes into the creeks more slowly. So anyway, uh, so that, that BDA got washed out pretty good. So I was hesitant to build another one, but <clears throat> like I said, I let the workers do what they, you know, I, I want to design it so any kind of numbskull worker can do it, you know foolproof design. So I, just, I showed up, I was like, like I could barely watch, you know, and they're, they're sitting there building the BDA however they want. I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, well for this one, we're gonna use three times as much willow, one per square foot. And we're gonna make it more concentrated at the bottom. And then we did all that and we're like, okay, this is cool, right? And then there was like checking the weather, checking this big rainstorm come up. Like, Ooh. So the next thing we did was we went about 10 feet downstream and placed a bunch of big rocks there and a bunch of willow around them too. So, so during high flow, so we called that a safety dam, right? And then also you have a scour pool, right? So when, that, when you have that big water current coming down, that big heavy force of water, you want it to hit a pool of water because that, that turbulent, it turns that, all that uh, kinetic energy into dispersed turbulence, randomized over a wider area. And then I could not believe it. I went back there after about 10 inches of rain just a few days ago. It was like not a scratch on it. It was crazy. Yeah. And for now, we're going to call it a day with you, but thank you so much. Yeah. And thank you for everyone. And